Labour has never done well in a UK election without doing really well in Scotland. We need deposit ATMs and we need withdrawal ATMs and we need a law that means that businesses have to accept cash. UK workers have had the most bargaining power essentially since the 1970s because the jobs market is so tight. Can Britain actually afford to maintain a global military presence? You're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Ewan Potts. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Welcome to the programme. You and I think we should learn a lesson from the events of the past 24 hours is that you and I should never promise to do something on the following day because (laughs) in the words of Harold Macmillan, events, dear boy, events. Events have occurred. (laughs) An event has just occurred, in fact. Yes, one bad news story for the government, the COVID inquiry, Boris Johnson's evidence has been toppled by a different bad news story for the government, that's of the resignation of Rishi Sunak's immigration minister. Robert Jemrick's quit his post yesterday, just hours after the government published its bill aimed at ensuring that its Rwanda deportation scheme can finally happen. Jenrick says the measures didn't go far enough to deter asylum seekers from crossing the channel. I'll just quote you some of his resignation letter. He says that he, re- I refuse to be yet another politician who makes promises on immigration to the British public but does not keep them. Yeah, I mean, look, the much hackneyed phrase, hastily called press conference, yes. uh, has, <laughs> is being trotted out again. I feel like this has been, been quite the number of years that we've seen a lot of hastily organised press conferences. Perhaps somebody has an emergency button they can press now <laughs> to call one of these. But we have had a hastily called press conference by the Prime Minister this morning in the wake of Robert Jenrick's resignation to try and address some of those claims, but also, I suppose, to project an image of strength and stability in his leadership as well. We have, of course, had the announcements about who's replacing Robert Jenrick as well, who shouldn't forget in all of this. Yes, so Number 10 has decided to split the role, of course, after the row over the legal migration figures. The government has appointed Michael Tomlinson for as Minister for Illegal Immigration in the Home Office, and Tom Persglove comes in as Minister for Legal Migration uh, and Delivery. I guess kind of stressing the two-pronged attack that it is not just uh, the illegal boat crossings that the Prime Minister wants to tackle, but also trying to bring down that record number, 745,000 people who came into the Mm. country. Uh, So attacking both those things are very, very different issues. You did get the feeling before that the government's focus was purely on stopping the boats, hence the slogan. But I think uh, with the uh, public reaction to those legal migration numbers, the government feels it needs to do something on that as well. Yeah, look, and the the Stop the Boat slogan reappeared again today on the lectern. In fact, that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was speaking from in the press conference Mm. too. The focus of this was very much on what he saw as the achievements of their Rwanda deportation bill uh, that was announced yesterday, which of course provoked the resignation by Robert Jenrick as well. It it was, as we were discussing yesterday, sort of the semi-skimmed version of this bill that we got. It declared Rwanda to be a safe country which means that the courts can no longer as the Supreme Court did in its recent judgment say that Rwanda is not a safe country that is now established as a fact of law and this legislation would exclude the courts from allowing them to make it any declaration otherwise that's one element I suppose that underpin the Supreme Court judgment that has been washed away by this bill or will be washed away by this bill of course it's not law yet Uh, there's also uh, going to be disapplying certain elements of the Human Rights Act as well from when it comes to adjudicating on whether or not it is a safe country uh, for uh, asylum seekers to be sent from and it's going to limit also the rights people will have to bring judicial reviews over this issue too. Yeah Sunak did say there are some, he said this in the press conference there are still some limited, very limited grounds which people can uh, uh, still challenge, but a lot of them has been disapplied, uh, as you say. But it isn't the full fat option, which a number of, uh, I don't know why we're talking about milk. It seems to be the... The, the, uh, the, the milk analogy. The milk yeah, analogy, exactly. yeah. It's not the full fat option that a number of Tory MPs uh, wanted to see. So it won't please everybody on the right. But I think... Well, it, it didn't. It, no, we well, it certainly <laughs> didn't. It certainly didn't please, please one of them. But it is it is the sort of semi-skimmed option, isn't it? So we, ha- we have got some of the things which some of the party was calling for. Yeah, and look, there. It, I've been reading, trying to read some of the analysis around this bill as well. Um, Mark Wilson, or Mark Elliott rather, over at uh, Public Law for Everyone, a professor of public law, from the University of Cambridge as well has been writing about the constitutional implications of this. Uh, he does point out there is this limited way that people can uh, appeal about the safe country issue. It's not that the courts would be able to say that Rwanda is an unsafe country in general. However, somebody could appeal on their personal circumstances to say that it might be unsafe for them. That's one of the doors that has been left open by this legislation as well. And then there's the whole question of having to decide who has the greater power in the separation of powers, the courts 
or Parliament. And he actually, uh, Mark Elliott, in his analysis, saying that perhaps this could open the door to that question, which isn't hasn't been live recently, but in fact, because of this bill, could become it. So that's another uh, debate for another day. Yeah, interesting stuff. Well, let's take a listen to some of what Rishi Sunak had to say in that uh, hastily arranged press conference, to use your words, Stephen. Now, what I'm saying, not just to my MPs, but to the entire country, is that I share their frustration. Right? My patience with this has worn thin. Right? One of my five priorities at the beginning of the year was to stop the boats, and I'm pleased that we've made progress, down by a third, for the first ever time, by the way. That shows that our plan is working, but we've got more to do. And that's why this legislation is so important. Well, the Prime Minister also hit out at his own MPs who are attacking his deal. For the people who say you should do something different, the difference between them and me is an inch, given everything that we have closed. We're talking about an inch, but that inch, by the way, is the difference between the Rwandans participating in this scheme and not. And as I said in my remarks, there's no point having a piece of legislation which means you can't actually send anyone anywhere. It's not going to help anyone, right? So when we're talking about an inch of difference and that inch making the difference between having an operational scheme where you can send someone or not, it's pretty clear that what we're doing is not only the right approach, it's the only approach. I mean, watching this, the Prime Minister was very forthright in defending his position. He kept pointing to those numbers that he gave, in, as we just heard from him there, the number of uh, crossings down by a third. It was the answer, in fact, to almost every question he was asked, because the key questions he was being asked is whether or not this is actually a vote on in confidence in his leadership and whether the vote on the bill should be viewed as something greater. He absolutely rejected that as a premise, but it was the gist of quite a lot of the questions that he faced from the press corps. Yeah, I think the interesting thing on this issue is, particularly with illegal immigration, I think that the United States government have a reasonable story to tell, as he keeps saying. A third, the numbers are down by a third. He mm. signed a deal with Albania, which has reduced the numbers greatly because lots of people coming across the channel were Albanian. He signed deals with other countries as well. But I think that message really isn't getting through. And I don't know if there's a problem in the Tory party with communicating the message uh, or if it's just people aren't listening or they're not receptive to the message on immigration. I think a lot of people are very cynical about politicians' promises on immigration. and Perhaps they don't believe anything uh, that they say. But yes, certainly on illegal immigration, that there is a reasonable story to tell. Less so on the legal migration, as we've heard. Yes, indeed. Well, look, let's go to Kitty Donaldson, our UK political editor, who was in the room for that press conference a little earlier. Kitty, talk us through, first of all, how this press conference was called. Morning, guys. Well, it was called in a hurry, basically. I think it was an attempt to get back on the front foot by the Prime Minister after the slightly chaotic events of last night when uh, the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, resigned quite late in the day. Um, And he was trying to put the case to his MPs that this was the furthest he could go on the Rwanda bill without it being illegal. Um, And whether he succeeded or not is is an open question at the moment. Kitty, you've you've been to lots of these press press conferences before. How would you describe the the PM's performance? He did sound a a little bit tetchy, didn't he, in in places? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, tetchy, tetchy is one word. Um, frustrated is another. Um, he's sort of slightly kind of gripping the, the the lectern as if, you know, I will not crack, I will not crack, I will not sort of start shouting at you all. Um, he was pretty tetchy. That's, yeah, that's right. He, he sort of did that thing where, you know, when you're speaking and you try and take a breath to kind of calm yourself down a bit because, you know, you're about, you're speaking too fast because you're trying, to, trying not to lose your temper. So he sort of, you know, it's kind of self-soothing like that, which was quite interesting. And, and do you, is he is he angry at his party? Do you do you think he feels that the the right need to kind of shut up and get behind him? Is it more complex than that? <laughs> it's it, it's. I mean, all prime ministers go through this, particularly Tory prime ministers that have trouble with the right of their party. We saw it all during the Brexit years. He, well, he's. I think he's trying to be a bit emollient to the right. He's saying, look. Guys, basically, there's only an, an inch between what you want and what I want, and that inch is kind of quite a big inch, really, because it's kind of withdrawal from the European Convention on Human Rights. But what he means is the legislation is as far as he can go without Rwanda saying this is illegal. So he's saying to the Tory, right, please, please back me. Some of them, however, have already decided that he's, you know, it's just not good enough for them, and they're they're plotting around as usual and trying to decide whether or not to back this bill. And the, the bill's coming, the first, uh, sorry, the second reading, which is the first vote, is coming on Tuesday evening about 7. So that'll be the crunch moment. 
And the, the other really interesting thing about this press conference is that when is, when is a vote of confidence not a vote of confidence, right? Because he was asked at least three times, is this a vote of confidence? Mm-hmm. And he said, no, it's, it's, it's not. Does that give them permission to the right of the party to vote down his bill? I mean, he would very much like them not to, but does it give them permission? And I think because it's such a crunch vote, these things kind of take on a momentum of their own. And even if Rishi Sunak keeps saying it's not a confidence vote, it's not a confidence vote, other people are suggesting it is a confidence vote. And therefore, if he loses it, I think we'll be in a position where Labour starts saying election now and trying to force, you know, votes of confidence in the government, not just the Prime Minister in the Tory party. So I think, you know, next Tuesday is a, max, a moment of maximum danger for, for Rishi Sunak. Kitty, it's, uh, you say confidence vote and it brings back a whole host of memories of the past couple of years, good good or bad, mm. depending on your point of view. I mean, on a scale of one to Liz Truss, how bad is this? <laughs> uh, it's not as bad as Liz Truss because there is no equivalent Rishi Sunak waiting in the wings, right? So, and also he hasn't kind of, well, depending on your view on the economy, but he hasn't done as much damage in such a short of time to the economy as, as Liz Truss, right? So he's not, he's not the kind of... Uh, Figure who's who's going to be ousted? I think there is there is no obvious other candidate. There are two different types of confidence questions going on at the moment. One is, do Tory MPs have confidence in him as leader? And some of them are saying no, we don't. But who would replace him? And also, you know, like to, to change leader again in in you know with maybe six months to a year before election, would we'll just look voters would just go, what are you doing? And then there's a the kind of separate question of. Of the Labour will push, which is can the government command a majority? And that's the kind of second point that I was making, the part I was making earlier, which is like, if you call this a confidence vote in your government, as Rishi didn't do in the press conference, then if you lose the vote, Labour can turn around and say, you can't command a majority, therefore we will push for a vote of confidence in the government. And if you lose that vote of confidence in the government, if the, if the Tories lose it, which they wouldn't because they've got a majority, but if they did, then he would be expected to try and form, reform a government or go to the country and have an election. Now, I don't think we'll get to that point because there's no way that, you know, Turkeys will vote for Christmas. Uh, Tory MPs may vote against the bill, but they're not going to vote down their own government. But even if once you get into that situation where people start talking about it, you, you realise that kind of just how sort of on thin ice this government is, right? It's like, can it really limp on for another year with 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 such fractures in its in its own side. Katie, I'm not going to ask you about a leadership election because as you've spelled out, that's just really not likely at the moment. Is there a sense of bias or regret, though, amongst some Conservative MPs? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, these are kind of like the, the ultimate worst customers, aren't they, right? Like, they're never happy. <laughs> like, you could, you, I, don't, I don't know, you know, unless you brought back Boris with a, uh, I don't know, with bells on, I don't know what would make them happy, right? Like, and don't forget, actually, they, it's not just the right wing of the party; it's the middle of the party as well. The kind of the wets, the leftists, and we, we we sort of have a kind of generic grouping name for them. They're called the One Nation Group. There are about 106 of them, although uh, probably two thirds of that are on the government payroll, right? So they're actually ministers. Um, so you've got to keep that bunch happy as, at the same time as keeping the right-wing bunch happy. And both sides, both the One Nation and also the kind of grouping that is the New Conservatives and the, the former ERG, the uh, European Research Group, basically for shorthand, the Brexiteers, they've gone off to their lawyer and said, can you look through this bill and see whether we can back it? But also the One Nation have, have hired a lawyer and said, can you go through it and see if we can back it? And well, what, what we're going to wait for now is both those sets of lawyers to come back and say yes or no. And that's kind of the next uh, step when we'll, when we'll see whether whether the, the bill will be voted, uh, there will be a rebellion on the bill on Tuesday. So we're, we're kind of on tender hooks waiting for those lawyers to come back. I mean, this does all have a bit of a kind of a ring of, of well, 2018, 2019 and 2020 about it as well. I, I, how much... Who are the key people that we need to be watching now, Kitty, to to see what happens next in this? Okay, so um, the people you need to watch from the One Nation group are uh, people like Stephen Hammond, he's a Tory MP, Stephen Hammond, Damien Green, 
uh, Matt Warman. That, that's the kind of centrist mob. And then on the right of the party, you need to watch Danny Kruger, Miriam Cates, Bill Cash. Bill Cash is one of the people going through the bill uh, with, with Martin Howe, the lawyer, um, uh, Marc Francois, people like that. You need to watch them on the right and, and wait and see what they say. I don't think they'll say anything for a couple of days because, you know, they've got their highlighter pens out and they're going through it inch by inch, um, line by line to see see whether they can back it or not. But that's what we're waiting for. Bill Cash, there's a name which will be uh, ringing alarm bells with some people. Uh, <laughs> why does the issue of immigration keep derailing the Conservative Party? This is supposed to be their issue, isn't it? It's supposed to be something that they like talking about, something they've got a good message on. It's, it's- but it's not—it's not just immigration, though. It's like it's Europe. Europe is the thing that always brings mm. them down, right? The minute you—the minute you bring Europe into the mix, you basically <laughs> basically like lobbing a hand grenade into the Tory party because they just can't. You know, it's what's—it's what brought down Major's government in the 1990s. Eventually, that and sleeve. But there's a kind of really sort of 95, 96 vibe going on at the moment, which is, you know, loads of people have been suspended for sleeves and you know what have you, but also. The Tory party is tearing itself apart over Europe. It's like history just keeps on repeating itself. I mean, the main, the main difference, of course, between 97 is that the economy is in a much worse state than it was when Blair took over. And also, Keir Starmer is not Blair. So, you might, you know, that's probably why we won't get the Labour landslide. But, you know, who knows if the Tories keep tearing each other apart. It's just a gift to Labour. Are you on resignation watch for anyone else? Uh, I don't think so. I think... Uh, we're talking about so Robert Jenrick's an interesting case, right? Because he he was one of Richard Sunak's key allies. He wrote that famous op-ed in the Times alongside Oliver Dowden, saying, you know, back, backing Rishi. He was he and Rishi, sorry, they 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 were kind of the three amigos um, back in the day. And since when, I think what Jenrick has seen has seen what Suella did, Suella Braverman did, put herself out there, used immigration and family values and right-wing uh, touchstones as, as a way of trying to get a following in the party. And everyone's now thinking about life post-Rishi, post the election, positioning themselves for what happens after the election, you know, whether they can have enough support to stand as leader of the party, et cetera, et cetera. And so having seen that Suella Braverman tried to do that and did it quite badly, right, she's not got the support, she, she went too far, she said too much. I mean, the, the the line about homelessness being a lifestyle choice, right, was just, you know, beyond the pale. Um, having seen that, I think um, Robert Jenrick spotted an opportunity to position himself as the kind of slightly more moderate face of what Suella Braverman used to do. Um, and therefore, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, on the, after the election, when all you know everything comes out in the wash, uh, Jerry puts himself forward as a candidate to lead the party. Mm, interesting. Kitty Donaldson, our UK political editor, hastily attending that hastily arranged uh, press conference. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Well, let's get more analysis of today's events and the challenges facing the Prime Minister. We're joined now by Gavin McGaw, who is President and Managing Director at communications firm Hanover Group. Uh, he's also worked for the Conservative Party in the past as a media advisor. Gavin, great to have you back with us on Bloomberg UK Politics. From a communications expert point of view then, how did the Prime Minister do in selling his message at this press conference? Well, it's who was selling the message to is key here. To me, he wasn't looking to the country. He was aiming it squarely at the Conservative Party, whether it was the backbenchers or any other MPs going out to their constituencies over the weekend, because he's going to face a really difficult weekend. The headlines are not going to be good. He's going to be really hoping that things uh, don't stay as broken as they are. But I fear he has not got a chance of that happening uh, and hope also that he won't have defections to the likes of the Reform Party. How big a communications challenge is this for the Prime Minister? He's had to sack one Home Secretary and had a, a minister resign all, all around this issue. Yeah, well, they've been in a real mess, I think, on the communications of this uh, from the start. You know, I don't agree with their position in immigration, but it is a valid one to have. It keeps coming up in focus groups. It is absolutely an issue you can see playing out across Europe. Uh, in fact, it will probably dominate uh, the European elections next year and we'll see the right move in uh, to uh, take a lead role on that in Europe. Um, but paradoxically, in the UK, you sort of see the the left, the centre left with Labour coming more and more to the fore and 20 points ahead in the polls. So th- 
Rishi will have seen this originally as an opportunity, an opportunity to isolate Labour's position on immigration, but also to head off any threat coming from reform. But they've got themselves in such a mess because it's not been clear. They've taken a position which at this stage looks like Clyde Cuckoo land in terms of whether it's possible to put in place or not. And he hasn't got a united party around him. He must be a man who's going into Christmas just shaking his head and wondering why he got himself into this mess. I wanted to ask you about Labour, actually. Uh, have you been surprised at the party, or at least Keir Starmer's willingness to fight on this battleground? Uh, you know, talk of cracking down on immigration and, and numbers is not uh, traditionally something that Labour politicians have been comfortable with. Well, he says he's a Thatcherite these days, doesn't he? Uh, only kidding. But, you know, <laughs> he, is, he is taking a very sensible position, understanding the polls. You know, businesses like my own and like my clients, immigration is an issue for them. But reverse situation to the vast majority of the people in the country. We want more people coming in because we need the skills. But there is absolutely a viewpoint out there, if you go particularly to red wall seats and others where there is too many. And the headlines recently about the numbers, 750,000 people coming in in one year, when Brexit had happened and people thought the opposite would happen, those don't help either. So politicians of all ilk have to deal with this in some way. They need an answer. The problem for Rishi Sunak is he's got the wrong answer to the question. Now, Keir Starmer mightn't have the right answer either, but the focus is not on him. And he is getting more and more time now to develop an answer that may work in an election. He's going to hope it goes away as an issue. I don't think it will, but he will hope he can get to the point where he can say something to the public that gives them hope and allows them to think, well, at least this law are competent compared to what we've got at present. Is it possible to have a, a, a good, quote unquote, good message on immigration, though, or on the issue of migration? As you say, it comes up in polling a lot, but it's it's one of those issues that people have quite divergent opinions on. Absolutely. And I think the, the problem is no one gets into the detail. No one talks about it, whether it is the inflationary impact of not doing it, the all those other issues which affect people day in, day out. People are very black and white about the issue. It's an incredibly difficult thing to communicate on. I think you can have principles, though, can't you, in terms of, and I think this is where Rishi, again, despite me not being a fan of the policy, he was trying to do this in terms of stop the boat, stop illegal immigration, let's stop the traffickers having their way. That's a very easy position to come to that most people will agree to, actually, uh, and then talk about skills-based um, immigration, which helps the country grow. And if you have those two things alongside each other, there is a route forward. The problem is the complexity the uh, Conservative Party have got themselves, they've got themselves a mess over it. And they've also found themselves, to quote that song, stuck in the middle, stuck in the middle of Labour's position on one side and actually their own centre-left uh, pa party members. And then the more right-wingers on the other side uh, who want to go further and want to stop pretty much any immigration and will not be happy with even skills-based immigration if they can avoid it. Sunak's strategy over the past year has very much to be kind of to focus to focus on the stop the boat slogan, hasn't it? To, to ignore the other issues around immigration, and there are lots of them, and to focus on the crossings of the English Channel. How, from a comms point of view, how, how wise do you think that strategy was? I think it's probably a decent communication strategy because, as I said, it sort of is the thing that most people will agree with if you get them on doorsteps. Uh, and they are also saying something which others aren't, um, which is it stands the might. And it's why I think that they have always seen this issue as a potential opportunity at a general election against Labour. The danger now is, though, because it looks like they're just a mess and whatever they say is not going to be able to happen. But also this people have lost faith and whether this government can govern. Um, and that means people like reform can come in from the other side and start saying even tougher, nuttier things. Uh, and Labour can be seen as more competent on lefts, even if they are in a battle with the likes of reform for what they want to do. And the Tories are just stuck in the middle, everyone just shaking their head saying, well, what can you do? You've not done anything. And in fact, everything you said you were going to do, you have failed to do. And that's the problem. This comes down to delivery. Um, and, you know, Sunak is looking today like a broken prime minister. Um, I don't think he'd lose a vote of confidence because the party has nowhere else to go. But he's going into Christmas when he was hoping to head off the news around Boris and the COVID inquiry with positive news, with even worse news for him around this immigration mess. He's up in front of the COVID inquiry next week. It's just not a good end to the year for anyone. Yeah, indeed. Gavin, thanks so much for joining us. That's Gavin McGaw there, who's President and Managing Director at Hanover Group, giving us his view uh, on today's event. So a broken Prime Minister, Tetchy, 
It's not been a good day for Rishi Sunak on this show, at least. No, it's been hard, hasn't it? And as Gavin says, a lot of tricky things coming up for him over the next uh, few weeks as well. I don't do it again. <laughs> don't say what we're going to talk about what in What are advance. we going to talk about tomorrow? What I we don't do? know. I think we should predict the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the weather forecast. OK, we're not doing that. That is it from us for today. If you like the programme, don't forget to subscribe. Give it five stars so other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Well, this episode was produced by James Walcock and our audio engineer was Mariful Hussain. I'm Ewan Potts. And I'm Stephen Carroll. We will be back with more tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.